Hello, this is the American Medical Association's Moving Medicine video and podcast. Uh, today, I'm joined by Jason Marino, the AMA's Director of Congressional Affairs in Washington, D.C., and we're going to discuss a huge win for telehealth and the advocacy efforts that helped power it through Congress. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Jason, thanks so much for joining us, and congratulations on the big win for the advocacy team on behalf of physicians and patients. Uh, this omnibus budget bill that passed Congress late last week, um, while the headlines were largely focused last week on uh, much needed support for Ukraine, the bill also helps address a lot of other issues, including the future of telehealth. And so before we get into the specifics on what the bill includes, let's take a little bit of a step back. How has Congress traditionally approached the issue of telehealth and why did the AMA you know, initially feel that we needed to get involved from an advocacy perspective? Well, Todd, I'm, I'm happy to be here today on this good occasion and uh, I'll dive right in. Sure, I mean, telehealth is something that the AMA, we've been talking about for a long time. Um, you could say decades, because the current uh, policy that we've lived under before COVID was uh, a telehealth system where there really wasn't much telehealth. We knew conceptually could work. In the 1960s, I don't know if you remember, there's a show called The Jetsons. And the Jetsons, <laughs> where the kids and the family did telehealth uh, with its physician. And so we know it's, this, this can work, but the policy that, that was in the statute was dated, it, it required you to live, to get telehealth, you had to live in a very, very rural area. Then you had to drive to what's called an originating site, which essentially is a, a, a office, a satellite office, because I was the technology then. You had to go to a satellite office, uh, and then sit down and then have your visit there. So you're driving 45 miles somewhere to some people to sit in some office to do it remotely. And very, very few people could meet that criteria. And that was the law in the books for years, for decades. And, and so in 20, uh, 2016, you know, the AMA, we would get comments like, why are physicians not using technology more? And, and why don't they adopt telehealth more? And we would say, well, look at the letter of Medicare statute. You can't do it. It's too restrictive. And so we worked with, uh, the AMA worked with our, uh, we have a council on legislation, which is a group of physicians that advises the advocacy team on how legislation should look and gives us advice and counsel and things like, how can you establish a relationship with that patient in two-way video? Yes, you can. And give us some rules of the road. And then we went to work with a very friendly senator at the time, senators, uh, Senator Schatz from Hawaii. And then there was Senator Cochran, Senator Wicker from Mississippi, and uh, who did a lot of telehealth at the University of Mississippi. And they were very interested in drafting a bill to update the Medicare laws to increase the coverage. And so we went through a painstaking process where we worked on every line how, would, how do we do this? And we got a good number of bipartisan members on both sides to drop a bill. And it, that was the 115th Congress. This is, this is May of, of uh, 2017. The Congress ended and the bill died because if it doesn't pass, it's dead. And so it was a good effort. And, and then in 2019, uh, the next Congress, the 116th Congress, we got the same group of senators together and we, uh, we uh, updated the bill we ended up getting one piece of it done as telestroke. So you can have telehealth coverage for, for telestroke, um, which was a, a small win, but it was something. And, uh, and when we had the rollout for that bill, this was in 2019, October, we had over six senators show up in one of these Senate office buildings. Over a hundred different groups were supporting it. And uh, with a packed room on a healthcare issue, bipartisan, the senators are speaking, this is a rare event, it doesn't usually roll out this way. And you could feel the energy it's just what was working against us is just congressional inertia. There's a lot of competing bills out there. Uh, this sounds good, but you have to remember that we are in a, uh, where the national debt is 29, was, it's 30 trillion today. It costs a lot of money. Medicare has some financial issues and solvency issues down the road that you have to be aware of. And there's a concern that aren't they going to overuse telehealth? Aren't patients just going to do a telehealth visit and do it in person, then call a doc again? Is, is that what's going to happen? There's a fear of that. Or is there going to be fraud and abuse? Are there going to be ordering G DME expensive equipment? Is there going to be people that call seniors and say, hey, do you want to talk to your vision right now? Press one, press two if you want to DME. And there's these fears. And so there's a fear of organization and fraud and abuse run rampant. And so that kind of kept things down. And there was always whispers at the Congressional Budget Office, which scores bills. And I think it's going to be a big score 
billions of dollars. And so while it was a good um, feel good bill, there were some obstacles. And I used to give a quote every year that Amy has an annual advocacy conference and we fly in about 500 leading physicians fly into DC and we talk about the issues of the day and telehealth has been a perennial one that we've been pushing since 2017. And I had a stat I used to always use where I said, as of 2016, only less than 1%, three tenths of 1% of seniors use telemedicine. Less than 1%, 2017, 2018, same stat. I would say over and over and I would say, that's not the future. We have these amazing iPhones that get better and better. Technology is getting better and better, but yet we're still not doing telehealth in less than 1%. That's not the future. And it was one of those, you have to wait for the right moment. And in the most recent version of the bill, this is in about 2019, we had a provision in there that, that we worked a lot, several drafts back and forth. Now, a lot of our top lawyers working on it. If there's ever a public health emergency, it would give the secretary of HHS authority to, to, to waive some of these restrictions on where you have to be, the called the um, geographic locations, and then the originating site where you can be in your home. And it would make that possible if there was a, some sort of public health emergency. Well, that happened, unfortunately. There was COVID and when COVID happened, in, in 2000, there was a called the CARES Act, which is a COVID relief bill. In, in that bill, they essentially took parts of this, the bill was called the Connect for Health Act. They took sections of that, put it in this larger bill, and next thing you know, it's law. And so it's one of those, your bill you may get behind, may, you may get lots of co-sponsors, may not go anywhere, but parts of it can get taken. It's, it's always what you hope. You're playing the long game. You're trying to build the co-sponsors, build support for moments like this. And so we got in there, and once that happened, it was revolutionary in that you went from uh, Medicare spending less than of all, all um, Medicare payment for physician services, less than 1% telehealth to at some point it went to 16% of, of Medicare dollars went to physicians for telehealth. And that is, and now it's settled back down recently to about four to 6%, which is still compared to less than 1%. And, 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 and it was used, obviously initially, there was a concern that the spread of COVID People didn't want to go into a physician office and you have telehealth as an option and it worked, but it's gone so much more since then because it's, you talk to senators, uh, uh, both sides of the aisle, Democrats, Republicans, they'll tell you COVID has been horrible. The one silver lining, they always use that word silver lining of this has been telehealth. We've done more innovation uh, in three, three months. This was back in 2000 uh, than in the last 10 years. And, and, and you give the coverage then a lot of physicians and others will innovate and the patients find it very convenient and members going back for town halls and they're hearing this tell them it's, uh, it's working, it's convenient. It's, it's, uh, so it's kind of where we got to, to here where we, it's a long- So uh, if, I, if I understand you correctly, using your Jetsons analogy, we may not have flying cars, but due to all this work over many, many years, we have been able to realize a huge advance in telehealth. And I don't think a lot of people know, Jason, I mean, the time frames for making changes like this um, are, are years of just dedicated effort and uh, working with different uh, uh, Congress people, senators, uh, and different sessions to kind of get these passed. I'm, I'm curious, you, you know, basically huge timing issue here with the pandemic, uh, which op offered, you know, an opportunity to advance this. But with these gains, uh, the kind of under a certain kind of level of emergency measures, how do we, you know, what do you need to do to continue these uh, in the future beyond the pandemic? So what's key is that it's been great now because we everyone, it's, the coverage is there in your home, your car, anywhere. It's, it's covered. It's very broad coverage, but it's because of the public health emergency and the, the fears that once that goes away, then you're back to your 1980s uh, statute on telehealth, where you have to be in a very rural area, drive to some satellite office, and it's poof, gone overnight. And, and that's pretty dramatic. And if you're a physician uh, practice and you're trying to retool to, to uh, incorporate telemedicine into your practice, not for everything, some things you still have to always come in person for imaging, for certain vi uh, visits where it means that you gotta have some touch involved, your surgeries, but for what, for what this is that it works, you need to retool your practice, your staff. But if you think it's going to go gone after 90 days, like the public health emergency ends, 
you know, how do you re retool your practice when you're not sure if it's going to go back to the policies of the 1980s where uh, there's no coverage? And so there's some certainty that physicians and patients need to, to plan ahead. Talk about that that time frame, Jason. Is it you know, how many days is it? When the, and is it from the day that this public health emergency is declared over? How does that work? What's the risk here? So the risk is, uh, so we're, we're in a period of time where every 90 days, the public health emergency can get extended or not. It was last extended on January 16th. So it's up on April 16th for an extension. The HHS, Thermal Health and Human Services, has committed to giving a 60-day notice to Congress if they attend to end the public health emergency. So we know that in April, since we haven't got that notice, on April 16th, it'll get renewed until, until July, mid-July, they'll extend the public health emergency. And then in mid-July, the thinking is, even this Congressional Budget Office assuming this, that in middle of July, they're not gonna extend it again. And the day that it's not extended, the next day, the, the statutory uh, waivers, I mean, the, the, the waivers that we had operating there now go away. So mid-July, unless Congress acts, then all the coverage in telehealth is, goes back to the old outdated policies. And so what do, what do we do? So what we've done is recognize context was election year. And we're in primary season right now. Not a lot gets done in the election year. Uh, and there's a lot going on in the world, as you know, with Ukraine and other things. And there's, it's, we, we would love to get, and we've been advocating for a permanent, permanent coverage. And there's, there's two bills, the Telehealth Modernization Act. Uh, there's another one, the Connect for Health Act. Two bills that would, that would make it permanent. We recognize that that's not likely to happen this year. So in the interim, we want to at least keep a, an extension, a statutory extension, uh, short term. And so what Congress, and we sent a letter with 300 organizations with us saying, let's at least extend the coverage until we, um, have, until we can extend it permanently. And so that's what's happened with this most recent appropriation bill that you mentioned was there was an extension for 151 days, about five months. So it would go from mid-July to about sometime in December where there'd be now a statutory extension of the Medicare telehealth coverage that would expire uh, in sometime in December. Is your aim then to get kind of more of a permanent thing after we emerge from kind of the, the period that we're in from a voting standpoint? That's the goal. I mean, you, you would say, you, you ask 151 days. I mean, is that really a big deal? Five months, but it really is. And, and it might not seem it, but the reason it is is because this is now Congress passing a bill uh, where they own the issue more. And they're going to, and if you see the, if you look at the congressional press releases on both sides, they are membership, Democrat Party, Republican Party, you'll see them talking about how they extend telehealth and how that's a good thing. When they go home to talk to their constituents, they're going to brag about it, as they should. And they own it a little bit. And one thing in Congress that I've learned in my years of lobbying is it's almost a congressional law of physics. When you extend something <laughs> that's popular, it tends to extend, the motion of an extension tends to keep going. And so that's why I feel confident that they've done this extension. They couldn't do more because it was dollars. It, it's billions of dollars. We heard one estimate it could be $5 billion just for one year of this coverage. So it was a dollars issue that restricted how much they could extend it. Um, but just to game it out, in December, I, I find it hard to believe during a lame duck session of Congress, they're going to go home for the holidays and just forget about telehealth and let it expire and go back to the old outdated policies. I don't see that happening. I see in the interim uh, studies coming out, more and more studies showing this works, this saves money. This is convenient for patients, helps patients that have mobility and transportation issues. It gives access to minoritized communities that, that didn't have access before. It's across the board, a win. And I think the more time we have, the more we can tell that story and kind of ease the fears of overutilization, which we haven't seen, or ease the fears of fraud and abuse. And in this short-term bill, there is a study that MedPAC will come out with in June of 2023 that looks at utilization, how much service, how much is it used, and then there'll also be an inspector general study on fraud and abuse. And we would argue that the second HHS has all the protect, all the authority to go after abusers. And any program, you're going to have some bad actors, unfortunately. But there are ways to go after that, those bad actors in current law. And so we're confident that this story is just being told and it's getting better and better and as time is on our side for this one. 
So I know uh, the passage of this bill represents years, actually, of collaboration and hard work from you and your team uh, and the Federation. Take us through some of the AMA's advocacy efforts and the obstacles uh, that you overcame ultimately that led to this one. Sure. The first, the first obstacle was just the, the just trying to get people to members and uh, organizations to focus on it. And, and so many years had just gone by where it just didn't have the tele coverage, just wasn't really a thought. And then initially, it was just a matter of getting groups to sign on to a legislation or the idea of legislation that we can do this. There was a fear: can you really do this? Can you really have a physician visit through a, through a, a computer? And 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 once we shown that yes, you can. Uh, you can do that, and that got more groups on board. Then it's a matter, you got to always have congressional champions. You always have to have certain members, like your Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina, your Senator Schatz from Hawaii, Senator Congressman Carter from Georgia, that, that work it, that drop the bill, that, that get their members, their colleagues to sign on. You have to get the people to help you get the co-sponsors. There's one bill that connects 60 co-sponsors in the Senate. That's the magic number in the Senate, 60. Filibuster proof. Just shows you the support that's out there. And then there's, there's issues that come along, like to the AMA, it's very important that you protect state licensure and not undermine that. Um, others want to just have one federal license. And there are a lot of meetings where, of minds with different organizations where you say, look, I know we're, we have to agree, disagree on this one, but we all can agree Medicare coverage for telehealth is a big deal. Let's all unite on that and not get so distracted on some of the bits and pieces of telemedicine that we can fight it out, so to speak, or give our sides going forward. We have to have the coverage first. And we were able to unite a lot of groups to kind of put aside our differences and unite around the bigger goal, coverage. And, and that is why we succeeded. And we convinced members of Congress, don't go down the rabbit hole of some divisive parts of it, stick to the bigger picture and it'll be more of a, um, and it broadens your support. And we just saw it grow from some key committee members to members who are not in any health committee, get members of Congress that never talk about healthcare, but also been talking about telehealth. And that's when you know you're, you're making some wins there. And we, AMA has a great grassroots um, operation where we can educate physicians and patients and urge them to call them to Congress and, and say, hey, we wanna keep, this is working, uh, keep it going, here's why. And that makes a big difference, always having that going. And, and do we have a lot of great physicians that, that are part of our leadership and the federation that, have a lot of credibility when they go to the Hill and talk about, I'm a physician, I'm telling you this works. And let me tell you why. And let me tell you my story about that. And that is very powerful. We've been doing that for years now. And it's finally, you know, we're seeing the fruits of all that. Just like a good long-term investment for your retirement, you have compounding returns. If you stay, play the long game, keep adding. This is one of those where we played the long game. We kept adding by making the bill better, better adding support until finally your next thing you know, you have a, a great product. I, I can't think of a better example of speaking with a uni unified voice, uh, which is such uh, an important part of what we do here at the AMA, along with the Federation. Um, Jason, I think you mentioned the Physicians Grassroots Network. You can find more about that on the AMA site if you'd like to participate in that. Again, hearing the voices of physicians and actual experience about how measures uh, like this are so important to physicians and patients is incredibly important. Jason, thanks so much to you for being here, to your team, to the AMA advocacy team as a whole, our federation and members of Congress uh, for supporting such an important measure. Uh, appreciate your perspective. We'll have more on the website uh, about details, about different types of coverage, especially for mental health, uh, which is so important uh, as we emerge from this pandemic. Uh, but that's all for today's episode. We'll be back with more. In the meantime, make sure to click subscribe on our YouTube channel. And you can find all our great uh, podcasts and videos at ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thanks for joining us. Please take care. Thank you.